the founder of MTF's.tv's Meet the Future. And I'm very excited today to be moderating a discussion with three prominent women business leaders about this Women Business Collaborative Annual CEO Report, the 2024 Women CEOs in America Report. And I'm joined by Gwen K. Young. She is the CEO of the Women Business Collaborative and as well as Anna Mack and Jennifer McCallum from our two partner organizations as well. And I want to kick things off with Gwen, essentially, to ask, what did the report find? Thank you, Kevin. Well, first of all, welcome, everybody. And I'm thrilled to be here with my collaborating CEOs. WBC does this report every year with Committee of 200, Catalyst and Ascend. We look at data from mid-year, so from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. We look across the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, S&P 500, Russell, but we also look at private companies over a billion and entrepreneurs over a million. So this report gives you across the industries and sort of the types of companies, what it looks like. And in broad brush, I know we'll talk about this further with with Anna and Jennifer, you know, we're holding steady. We're about 8.7% of CEOs across all of those. The Fortune remains steady, the Russell grew, private companies grew, and in case you haven't missed the headlines, entrepreneurs are growing, women entrepreneurs, not only in terms of companies, but the percentage of franchises they own and revenue. So what we're seeing is kind of a holding steady, um, but keeping to move, and we're just excited to talk about this report, because in addition to the data, we have insights into issues like the glass cliff, what is the state of DEI in the workplace, and the 10 recommendations. So it's really a bit like a playbook of Jennifer and I were talking backstage, putting this all in one place, being able to see what the landscape looks like. And then really importantly, being able to see who are those women that lead and continue to lead. So I think that's a great point, um, Gwen. And I, and I would toss it now to Jennifer, you know, as the CEO of Ascend Leadership, I mean, one of the things that you and I were talking about just even before the report came out was how should we be interpreting the data? Because the report suggests that this pause that Gwen alluded to, it might be a temporary blip uh, or the start of a trend. So how should we be interpreting interpreting the data, Jennifer? Yeah, I just want to clarify. I'm the CEO of Catalyst. My lovely Hi. colleague here is the CEO of Ascend, Anna, and I think we'll, we can tag team this. So um, where I think Catalyst is is really strong is looking uh, at our, our supporters, by the way, uh, are primarily Fortune 500 organizations. And so as Gwen said, I think there is, is we need to look at this with both, you know, kind of a current reality lens and also with a, a hope and optimism lens. So from the Fortune 500, and I, I've been quoted broadly as saying, we are making change, but the change is glacially slow. So just to call it as it was in the data, men are still leading 90% of the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we have seen new women CEOs come. We've seen them go. It has been flat year over year. And I think the question is, with the first time that it's been flat, is this a blip? Is this a new concerning trend? And um, we're all, you know, we, we were all a little concerned when we realized we weren't making uh, change at the same pace as before in the Fortune 500 and the S&P 500. And so just to put a quick numbers around it, and then I'm going to turn it to Anna, because Anna wrote a beautiful piece in the report about women of color specifically and people of color specifically. When we look historically, and I think Gwen, call me on this, but I think we've been tracking this data for, you know, since about 1999, 2020. The only time we experienced um, 100 plus percent growth in a five year period was all the way back from 2000 to 2005. If we look at our goals, our WBC co uh, collective, our collaborative goals, we are trying to get to numbers by the year 2030. And we have never seen the type of growth that we will need to get there. So to put it just to put a pin in it, and this is, I think, my concern and my call to action is um, if we want to hit our WBC goal of 20 percent of Fortune 500 CEOs, women by the year 2030, we will have to double, have 100 percent growth. And this past five year period, we saw about a 33% growth. So I just wanna call out the challenge and then we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about the solution. Anna, take it from here. The same, right? So some may say, well, it's but given what you just heard from Jenna, to even get to something, we're not even talking about parity, if you wanna use that word. We're just trying to that we as a collective have set, we 
going at these low two digit single double digits, which means all of us and our company and the people that really support this work, we have to look at it through a lens of how do we accept it and what are some things to continue to careers and not lose the commitment. Mm-hmm. I think as a comment, this is why it's important to look at data over a period of time. Yeah. Really go deep each year, right? Because sure. we can excuse it as, oh, it's the economy. It was X companies. But when you look at a period of time, it just reamplifies the need for this continued work. To. And I know we're having a little bit of audio difficulties with, with Anna, so I'll, I'll bring it back to, to Gwen for a second, because one of the things that Jennifer and Anna are, are talking about is just the importance of having pipelines to get to that 100% growth, um, to get more women CEOs. So how can companies and corporations, and uh, in order to create those pipelines, to build robust pipelines to get more women CEOs? I think there's a couple things, and I know Jennifer and Anna and I talk about this all the time. So, I mean, the first thing when you talk about the pipeline, actually, is that you've got to start with commitment, not just from sort of the CEO and kind of C-suite of the company, but from the board. So one is, you know, understanding that that diverse leadership, you know, drives the business bottom line. So there's commitment on the board. There's diverse leadership on the board. There's the board and the CEO working together in succession planning. And then the second thing, and this is where I think we're watching this closely, all of us, right, is that the succession planning, professional development, that's where we're seeing a little bit of a drop, right? So we're seeing a drop in senior leadership from like 1.2 to 0.5%. We're seeing some women leaving the C-suite. Now, on the upside, many women leaving the C-suite are founding their own companies, which talks about sort of the entrepreneurial piece of it and going other places from the public companies. But it's really making that commitment to succession planning, pathways, professional development, And then really, as you see all of us here, building that network and having that conversation about the women that are there, and especially the women of color that are there, that are available, that are around, so that when you make that intentional commitment, you set those targets as a company, you you set up the professional development, the networks, in order to make actionable your commitment, that's, I think, where the power comes from. And Jennifer, I might want to turn it to you, because we've talked a little bit about how you build that pipeline, how you build those pathways. So what I love about this conversation and about our, you know, our, our collective uh, organizations here is we're focused on the systems. It's never focused on what, you know, what the women need to do. Women do not need to be fixed. What are the systems around them? So Gwen talked about pipeline. She also talked about board. And I think it's going to be, it's a both and. And I'm going to tell you a story about what we've been doing for the last seven years at Catalyst. First of all, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of momentum, positive momentum on the board front, where we look at Catalyst, what we call our CEO champions for change. And this is about 90, almost 90 uh, very large organizations, mostly Fortune 500, whose CEOs have made a commitment on behalf of their organization. So we look at this set of what we call best in class companies, and we compare it to the benchmark. So um, first of all, the board representation, including uh, women and women of color for these champion companies, the overall women are in the 39 percent range, which is significantly higher than the benchmark of about 30 percent. Now, women of color. And I think it's important. Anna was trying to tell us about the critical need to focus on women of color um, still above the benchmark where it's about 10 percent in our champion companies, single digits, about 8 percent in the non-champion companies. Okay, but here's what I love, and here's what I want. Um, I want everyone to, to think about their own organizations. This is what these organizations are committing to. First of all, they can't even get into a champion status unless they have at least two women on their board, two women on their executive team, direct reports to the CEO, and at least one woman from a marginalized racial or ethnic group. And the commitments that they make are as follows. The companies guarantee that they will give us their data every single year. They are tracking the representation of women at all levels of leadership, starting from the board. They are tracking their retention. They're tracking their pay equity data. uh, They're tracking the transparency, or we're tracking the transparency of that. And when we pull all of that together at the organizational level, we can tell you 
that they are making progress at a much faster rate than other organizations. So that's the organizational commitment. I'll pause there because I can also talk about the leadership, the CEO and executive commitment, but I, I no, want to no, offer no, either no, Anne no. or Gwen. I'll follow up with you on that and then Gwen, I'll give you the last word because we are nearing the last five minutes. And, and Jennifer, in your book, you really, you write about this and her book, for those of you who, who want to go check it out, it's called In Her Own Voice, A Woman's Rise to CEO. Because it's not just to your point, according to the data that was released, it's not just about, you know, climbing the ladder. It really has to start with the CEO and the board. So let's what what role does the board have to play in encouraging this shift? Can I, I want to pick up on Jennifer's point about the accountability, the data and that we use in the board. Right. So part of that is really making sure you're tracking the data, making it transparent and using that to make informed and analytical decisions. So if you have a diverse board, and I know Anna will talk about this, you know, and we, we talk about this in the staffing industry well, right? If you have diversity on one side of the table, that makes your intention much more actionable. But you've got to use the data, make it transparent, and be clear about how you're making decisions and where. And another thing about the board that, you know, we talk a lot about is that women need to be in leadership positions on the board, right? So you need to walk into the board, you need to be on the NOM committee, right? You need to be on the governance committee, you need to be in a position on the board where you can kind of influence power. And, you know, every month we look at women not that are joining the boards of public companies, but we also look at who's identifying with race and ethnicity. And then we talk about, well, where do you want to be once you're there? You know, you've got to be in the room, you've got to be at the table, but the board really needs to hold the, hold the organization accountable. It needs to help that organization make their commitment actionable. And, and that, that commitment is using the data, using the analysis, and it's being transparent and talking about it and showing where you are and what you're doing. And it's also a lot of mentoring, Jennifer. I mean, Ascend has done a lot of work in building supportive communities and the pipeline and the mentoring and, and Atlas has a, has the workplace study as well. But from, and I know we're having issues with Anna's uh, audio, but I did just want to, you know, talk about that for a second because Anna has really been such a transformational leader and an advocate on the mentoring aspect. But Jennifer, from, from your perspective to what Gwen was saying and the work that Anna's doing, how does that mentoring and that board leadership really make an impact? Yeah, and I actually want to move. So Gwen talked beautifully about the board. I'd like to talk about the executives themselves. And um, and yes, Anna has built communities all over the country to support um, uh, women of color, specifically um, Asian American. And, and I would love for Anna to talk about that herself. But the the word I want to make sure we're we're not forgetting is this idea of sponsorship. So when I go back to the role of the executive in those CEO champions for change, and, and I'll tell a quick story. I was talking to a CEO of a global multi, uh, of a multinational based out of uh, France uh, last week. And he said, I know the role I have committed to play. I know I need to actively sponsor women. I know I need to role model change both internally and externally. I know I need to drive and bed inclusive leadership behavior, behaviors. Jennifer, it's really hard. It's hard because I, as a white man, and he became very vulnerable about the role of the sponsor and how he needs to continue to develop. Um, and so uh, one other thing the Catalyst does is really focus on the role of gender allies in the form of coaches, mentors, and sponsors, because we can't accelerate change without the critical role of the leadership majority, which today is still men. For sure. And um, and I think, Gwen, to your point, I mean, and I'll give you the last word. How crucial is it that, especially in this particular climate that we're in, that it be an inclusive movement that includes allies um, to 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 make sure that, to, to Jennifer's point earlier, that there can be 100 percent growth in the years ahead? It's critical. And that's why we talk about, you know, in the report, we talk about men, but we talk about inclusive companies, right? We're talking about building inclusive societies, engaging with the community, looking at the bottom line together, right? And I, I know at WBC, you know, we have more than 20% of our community that are men, but it's really about working together. And so we talk about allyship, we talk about sponsorship, we talk about doing it together. And most importantly, to Jennifer's point, right, as women are still only 8.7 and, you know, 10.4 in the fortune, we all have to work together. It has to be a commitment from everybody, right? And we have to work together across all aspects of diversity as well. And that's why we talk a lot about all women, because it's incredibly important that we look at the society, that we look at the companies and, and work on this together. And so that's why 
I you know, encourage this audience. That's why we do things like today. That's why we do this report collaboratively. And each of us, Anna, Jennifer, and I, all work with the companies that work with Ascend, that work with Catalyst, that work with WBC, to have these conversations and drive results. Well, Jennifer McCallum, President and CEO of Catalyst and Mock, President of Ascend Leadership. And of course, my good friend, Gwen Young, CEO of the Women Business Collaborative. Thank you each so much. I'm Kevin Cirilli, and thanks for listening. Thank you.